Okay, let's open our Bibles. As you can see on the screen behind me today, we will be concluding, by God's grace, John chapter 6, as we will be studying verses 60 through 71. Let's read our text, and then let's dig into our text. Starting in verse 60, we read that, Therefore, many of Jesus' disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. And Jesus was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray Jesus. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, Amen. Okay, well, as you can see, today will be part three, where we study this sermon that our Lord preached. The sermon that is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Bread of Life. Whereas we have seen throughout this sermon, our Lord continued to declare His deity, I am the bread of life, eternal life. Well, today we are going to see how the people responded to our Lord's sermon. Again, we know our context, our Lord and His disciples, along with a massive crowd, many of whom our Lord had created food for the day before on the eastern shore and had fed them. Well, now our Lord and His disciples and that crowd, they were on the western shore, northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, in Capernaum. Capernaum used to be our Lord's headquarters. They were in the synagogue in Capernaum, and our Lord preached this sermon that we've been studying in John 6, His Sermon on the Bread of Life. Again, where He clearly declared His deity, and where He clearly taught the doctrine of election. Well, how did everybody respond to our Lord's sermon? Again, our Lord was at the peak of His popularity. He had just performed the day earlier. The largest miracle He had ever performed, largest in terms of the number of people who were impacted by it at one time. Our Lord created food and fed over 20,000 people. Well, we saw how the people responded to that miracle. They immediately wanted to make him their earthly king. Get rid of the Romans, usher in a welfare state, and you know what? Jesus, you can make us food as much as you want, morning, noon, and night. Well, our Lord knew 
why those people were looking for him, why those people were following him. They had a superficial, self-centered, earthly-focused type of faith. And as our Lord preached this sermon, we see how people started to respond while they were sitting there in that synagogue. And today, we are going to see how those people responded when our Lord finished His sermon. And if you're taking note, we're going to see one group who was present during the sermon. We call them the hostile-hearted religious leaders. You can underline verse 41. They are called the Jews. Verse 52, you can underline, they are called the Jews. I've taught you this before in John's Gospel. When he refers to the Jews, more times than not, he's talking about the religious leaders. And so, one group who was sitting there listening to our Lord's sermon, you had a group of hostile-hearted religious leaders. And if you want to write this down, when it came to our Lord's works, miracles, they hated them. Remember, we've already studied time and time again, they said that Jesus was performing those works, not in the power of the Holy Spirit, but rather in the power of Satan. So when it came to our Lord's works and our Lord's words, this group right here hated both our Lord's works and words. Another group that was present during that sermon, we are calling the half-hearted false disciples. You can underline them. Verse 60, many of Jesus' disciples, when they heard this, our Lord's sermon, what did they think of His words? They said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? As we're going to see today, verse 66, this same group, they withdrew from Jesus and were not walking with Him anymore. Why? When it came to our Lord's works, they loved His works. In fact, they kept clamoring for more. Perform more signs and miracles so we can believe in you. They loved our Lord's works, but they hated our Lord's what? Words. Why? Because they were half-hearted, false disciples. Another group sitting in there during the sermon, we are calling the wholehearted, true disciples. You can take a look at them. In verse 68, Simon Peter, speaking for the twelve, said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So the wholehearted, true disciples loved our Lord's works and loved our Lord's words. Are you starting to see the clear distinctions here? And then finally, we are going to see that there was a person sitting there during the sermon. In fact, he had been embedded amongst the 12 apostles. His name was Judas. He was the devil-hearted apostate disciple. He pretended that he loved our Lord's works and that he loved our Lord's words. But he was devil-hearted. In fact, you can just read about him. Verse 70, Jesus said, Did I myself not choose you the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil. Verse 71, we know who he was referring to, Judas, 
the son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve, yet he was going to end up betraying our Lord. He had pretended to love our Lord's works and love our Lord's words. In fact, he openly professed that he loved our Lord and his works and words, but in the end, his true colors were seen. He committed apostasy. Apostasy, where our Lord has warned time and time again, and the scriptures warn, that hell will be hotter for the apostates. Those people embedded in the church, just like Judas was embedded amongst the twelve. Those people embedded in the church today who profess to love Jesus, his works and his words, but in the end they end up denying him. Scripture warns that a person like that is called an apostate and hell will be hotter for people like that. And so today we're going to see these four groups of people sitting there who had been listening to our Lord's sermon. And we're going to see some reactions. We're going to see many who rejected our Lord. We will see a small group who received the words of our Lord. And we will see one person there in his deception who played a game and pretended to receive all that our Lord did and taught. Make sense? And oh, by the way, as we're going through this sermon, taking a look at these groups and their responses, I want you to think about where you fit in when it comes to our Lord's works and our Lord's words. Now, let's take a look at this first group here real quick. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Again, I had you underlined in verse 41 and in verse 52 where John describes a group of people as the Jews. In John's Gospel, as I said earlier, he, a word is used to describe the Jews. In the Greek, and it's a little hard for me to, uh, to pronounce, but I will try, e udaioi or e udaion, which literally means the Jews, but very often when John uses that phrase, he's referring to not the Jewish people in general, but rather the Jewish religious leaders in, I guess, in specificity. I can't even say that word, right? Let me show you a couple examples. Go to John chapter 3, verse 1. We read, there was a man of the Pharisees, religious leaders, named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, the board of religious leaders there, the Sanhedrin. E-U-Dion, the Jews. You see it? He was a ruler of the religious leaders. Uh, go to John 5. And we see another example of John describing this same group of people. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 10. We've already studied this passage way, way back. Uh, Jesus had healed a man who had been afflicted for 38 years. Well, the, that was the good news. The bad news was, in the eyes of the religious Jews, Jesus had done this healing on the Sabbath which they said was no good. And we pick up the story in verse 10. So the Jews, the religious leaders, Eudion, they said to the man who had been healed, it's not permissible 
for you to carry your pallet. Like, hello, you think they would have been happy because a miracle is performed. This man who had been afflicted for 38 years suddenly could walk and carry his pallet. They go, no, 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 this is done on the Sabbath. You can't do that. Well, when the religious Jews found out that it was Jesus who had performed this miracle, again, on the Sabbath, we read, verse 16, for this reason, the Jews, Eudion, the religious leaders, were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, verse 17, my father, declaring his deity, is working until now, and I myself am working. Watch this. For this reason, verse 18, therefore the Jews, religious leaders, Eudion, were seeking all the more to kill Jesus. Why? Well, because he was not only in their, in their eyes breaking the Sabbath, which he wasn't, but he was also calling God his own Father, which he was. And what did that mean in their eyes? That Jesus was making himself equal with God, which he is, second person of the Trinity who took on flesh, right? And so back to our text in John chapter 6, it's very clear here that, again, John in his gospel, when he refers to the Jews, he's not speaking to all Jewish people generally, but he's referring to the Jewish religious leaders specifically. And that's why we have them listed in the group of the hostile-hearted religious leaders. Why? What did they think of our Lord's works and our Lord's words? They hated them. As opposed to Judas the apostate, who pretended to love our Lord's works and words, right? So, let's now kind of do a real quick recap of our Lord's sermon. And now that we kind of have a picture of these different groups, let's take a look and see their responses. Rejection, reception, and deception. And again, think about where you are right now when it comes to your feelings towards our Lord's works and His words. John chapter 6, let's just pick up the story. Back up in verse 25, we know that the large crowd whom our Lord had fed the day earlier on the eastern shore showed up that next morning looking for Jesus. He and his disciples were on the northwestern shore, and this large crowd frantically sought Jesus, came looking for him, and finally found him, verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, again, Capernaum. They said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And look how our Lord rebuked them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, the signs, the miracles our Lord performed, which pointed to Him as being the promised Messiah. Jesus said, you're not looking for me because you're looking at me as the promised Messiah. No. Why were they looking for Him? Well, Jesus said, because you ate of the loaves the day earlier and were filled. They came looking for Jesus for more food. That's why Jesus said to them in verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. And how does a person get eternal life? Jesus says, the Son of Man will give it to you. Salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And why Christ? Because Jesus said, on him the Father God has set his seal. Well, 
How did the people respond? Therefore they said to him, verse 28, what shall we do? So that we may work the works of God. I mean, didn't Jesus just say in the verse prior? He'll give the gift of eternal life. He said, well, what, 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 what can we do to get that? And I think also what they were saying is this. Okay, Jesus, you're not interested in making some more of those tasty crackers for us. Um, how do we get that power? What works do we need to do to kind of move God to give us the same power so we can just make our own food like you did for us yesterday? That's why Jesus said in verse 29, this is the work of God. You're looking to do some works? How about this one? It's God who does the work when it comes to salvation. And this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Jesus referring to himself. How'd they respond to him? Well, what will you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? I mean, the day before, Jesus healed a ton of people in that crowd, and then he fed them by creating food for them. Next day, um, come on, keep performing, keep performing. We need to see some signs here. In fact, they challenged Jesus. Verse 31, they said, um, our fathers, referring to the Jews in the Old Testament, ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he, God, gave them bread out of heaven to eat. In other words, uh, Jesus, Moses did something really good. He fed all of our ancestors, two million people that are wandering through the wilderness. Jesus, can you outdo that? Jesus responds, verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave them food. It was God from heaven. And by the way, that food, manna, was not meant to impart eternal life. It just took care of their physical needs. And that's why Jesus says, it was not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father, and now Jesus points to himself, who gives you now the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life, eternal life, to the world, Jews and Gentiles. And look how they responded, verse 34. Lord, always give us this bread. Did they finally receive our Lord's words? No. And how do we know that? Verse 35, Jesus finally says, you know, let's cut to the chafe. Hello, I am the bread of life, <laughs> right? Declaring his deity, a go away me, in the Hebrew, Yahweh. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. This was happening right there in that synagogue. And then Jesus turned to the doctrine of election. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me. Love gift from the Father to the Son. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, again declaring his deity, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, the elect, I lose none, but I raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day pretty clear, right? Deity of Christ, doctrine of election. Christ clearly declared who he was, I am, the bread of life, where he came from, heaven, and what he provides, the free gift of eternal life. Well, let's take a look at this first group, the hostile heart of religious leaders. How did they respond to this? Verse 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling about Jesus. Why? Because he said, I'm the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus? The son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered them and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Doctrine of election. 
And then Jesus quotes from Isaiah 54, it is written in the prophets, and they, referring to the elect, shall all, referring to the elect, be taught of God. Because the elect not only believe in the works of Christ, they also love the words of Christ. Right? Jesus said in verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life, Jesus said again. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, which could not impart eternal life. And they died. But this is the bread, Jesus is referring to himself, which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, Jesus said, that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, comes to Christ, beholds Christ, believes in Christ, Jesus says he'll live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world, Jews and Gentiles, is my flesh. Jesus predicting how he would give his body and shed his blood there on the cross, predicting his once for all perfect substitutionary atonement. Well, let's go again. The hostile heart of religious leaders. How did they respond? Verse 52, they began to argue with one another and say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Do you see how hostile hearted they were? Jesus then turned up the heat. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. In other words, unless you believe in who Jesus is, where he came from, and what he accomplished through his perfect life, and his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. Unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, unless you believe in Christ's deity, in Christ's incarnation, in Christ's perfect life, in Christ's crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension and his intercession and his second return, unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, Jesus said, you have no life in yourself. Why? Because it is He, and only He, whom the Father has set His seal on. This is my Son, the Father declared from heaven, whom I love, and with Him I'm well pleased. His perfect life, His substitutionary sacrifice, has been accepted by the Father. There is no one else who can offer the perfect sacrifice which the Father will accept. That's why Jesus said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, again, metaphorically talking about coming to him, beholding him, believing in him, taking all of Christ, who he is and what he accomplished. Jesus says, unless you do that, you have no eternal life. Why? Because there's no other Savior. He continues, verse 54, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came out of, down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. Pretty clear, isn't it? We saw how the hostile-hearted religious leaders reacted. They hated our Lord's works and they hated our Lord's words. But take a look at the next group, the half-hearted false disciples. Verse 60, therefore, many of his disciples, mathetes, learners, followers, when they heard this, heard what? His sermon, the sermon on the bread of life. 
how did they respond? Oh, 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 hold on. No, 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 no. This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Earlier they had said, show us some more works. Look how they responded to his words. Not just what he said about his flesh and his blood, but the entire sermon. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a difficult statement. Difficult in the Greek. Skletos. It means hard, inflexible. It cannot be swallowed. It cannot be taken in. It's not that they didn't understand what Jesus was saying about himself. They simply couldn't swallow it. It was skletos. Because he clearly declared his deity. He clearly taught the doctrine of election. He clearly proclaimed that eternal life is in him. And these people who had claimed to be followers of Christ. They loved his works. Keep feeding us. Keep showing us signs. But they hated his words. This is a difficult statement. Hard, inflexible. We can not listen to it. We cannot tolerate it. By the way, just hop over to chapter 8. Verse 31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You can't love our Lord's works and hate his words and be a true disciple. Jesus makes it clear, if you continue in my word, his word, which reveals who he is, how he is, and describes for us his wonderful works and his wonderful words, right? Jesus says, if you're you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Back to our text, chapter 6. Why do we say these guys, this group here, we call them half-hearted, false disciples? Again, what do they think of our Lord's words? Verse 60, when they heard this, his sermon, they said, this is a skletos statement. Cannot tolerate it. Who can listen to it? Do you see? They had claimed to be followers of Christ. Man, they, they were frantically looking for him the next day after he had fed them. Lord, when did you get here? And they sat there and listened to his sermon. But it became very clear. They had no interest in receiving him or his truth. They rejected his truth, and thus they rejected the Lord. They were false disciples. That's why Jesus said to them, verse 61, he, had, he was conscious that his disciples, these half-hearted false disciples, grumbled at this. And Jesus said to them, does this cause you to stumble, what I'm saying? My truth about me? Does this like cause you to fall into a trap? Verse 62, Jesus says, how about this? What then if you see the Son of Man, referring to himself, ascending to where he was before? Throughout the sermon, Jesus said, I've come down from heaven. I've come down from heaven. I am the bread of life who has come down from heaven, right? He says, how about this? You don't like my words? How about this? How about if you right now watch me ascend back to heaven? Will you believe in me then? What's the answer? No. And how do we know that? Verse 63, Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. Talking about Holy Spirit regeneration. The flesh profits nothing. And then Jesus said, the words that I have spoken to you in this sermon are spirit 
and our life. These people were not regenerated. The evidence? They could not tolerate truth about Christ. Again, as long as Jesus was going to be their earthly king, get rid of the Romans, and keep making them food every day? Oh, yeah, yeah, we love you, Jesus. But did they really? No. They loved the Jesus of their own desires. They did not love the true biblical Jesus, the true Messiah. And again, the evidence? They hated his words. They were not regenerated. Again, Jesus said, verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Verse 64, Jesus said, but there are some of you who do not believe. He called them out right there. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. But of course, he's omniscient, right? <laughs> and he also knew who it was that would betray him. And that's why Jesus said, verse 65, again, repeating the doctrine of election, for this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me for salvation unless it has been granted from, it has been granted him from the Father. And take a look at how they responded to that. Verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples, what kind of disciples? Look at the second group, half-hearted, false disciples, withdrew and were not walking with him any. Jesus, in his sermon, emptied the synagogue with his words of truth and life. They were not the elect. Hostile-hearted religious leaders hated our Lord, hated his works, hated his words. The half-hearted false disciples loved his works, hated his words. And by the way, our Lord, prior to this sermon, was at the peak of his popularity, as I said earlier. Had he just softened his words a little? Maybe it would have been more, those words would have been more tolerable to these people, right? Nope. What did Jesus say? No one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. And I'll tell you something. I watch preachers, you know, like people send me links about preachers on, over on the internet and stuff, and I watch how they try to soften the words of Scripture to make those words more palatable, more tolerable, more digestible. And people will take in soft words. You know, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Don't worry. God loves you the way you are. Don't worry, we're not going to talk about sin. We're not going to buy judgment. We're not a church like that. We're all about positivity. And therefore, fluff is being taught from the pulpit. And people are saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Nope. When the truth about Christ is taught, when the pure, unadulterated truth about Christ is taught, straight from the scriptures. Let me tell you, friends, that's hard-hitting truth, but that makes sense. That's holy truth given by our holy God to us who are sinners. Of course it's going to hit us hard. Of course it's going to be difficult. But those who are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, no matter how hard those words are, will receive those words and 
and will be changed, transformed by those words through the power of the Holy Spirit. And how do we know that? After this massive group of half-hearted false disciples scattered? Verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, which tells you <laughs> how empty that synagogue became, that he suddenly turned to the twelve. And our Lord said to them, you don't want to go away also, do you? I mean, think of that. Think about all our Lord had done up there in Galilee. Great Galilean ministry. And there it is, right towards the end of his great Galilean ministry, right here. And the people scattered. By the way, he just fed them the day before and just healed them the day before. And here in the synagogue during the sermon, he just kept teaching truth. He kept saying, I'm the bread of life. You come to me, you have eternal life. So Jesus says to the twelve, um, you don't want to go away also, do you? Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him. Answer for the twelve. Lord, I love this. To whom shall we go? I love that. Boy, Peter, way to go here, huh? To whom shall we go? You have the what? Words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, that's an example of wholehearted, true disciples who not only believe in the works of Christ, but who love the words of Christ. Lord, to whom shall we go? There's no one or nothing out there for us. You, Lord, have the words of eternal life. And we believe by God's regenerating grace that you are the Holy One of God. Do you see the difference between the hostile heart of religious leaders and the half-hearted false disciples and the wholehearted true disciples? What did Jesus say? The words I speak are spirit and life. Well, Peter, speaking for the twelve, what did he declare? You have the words of life. We don't want to go anywhere else. To whom shall we go? You are the Holy One of God. And friends, that declaration, that attitude towards Christ, His works and His words, that is the attitude and declaration of every wholehearted, true disciple. Are those your words about Christ? Your attitude towards His works and His words? Do you believe He is the Holy One of God, the only Savior? And do you love his words, his words of truth and life? Because there are some who pretend to love our Lord's works and words. In fact, here is the prototype pretender who was right there embedded amongst the twelve in that synagogue when Peter spoke up for the twelve and said, To whom shall we go? You have the words of life. You are the Holy One of God. Verse 70, Jesus said to them, Did I myself not choose you? But of course, <laughs> a wholehearted true believer has been chosen by God because no one can come to him to Christ, unless the Father grants it, right? Jesus said, did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you within the twelve 
is a what? Devil, a deceiver, pretending. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree with what Peter said. Oh yeah, thumbs up. Your works, your words. Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the Holy One of God. Jesus, verse 71, was talking about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, Jesus knew, was going to betray him and commit apostasy. All that time proclaiming, yep, Jesus is the one. And in the end, denying and betraying. Why? Because he was devil-hearted. He was an apostate disciple. And so we see four groups sitting there in that synagogue in Capernaum listening to our Lord's sermon. And we see various reactions to our Lord's sermon. Massive group in that sermon, in that synagogue, rejection. Small, small group. Reception. And one? Deception. Pretending to have received Christ's words of truth. And friends, this is pretty much the end of our Lord's great Galilean ministry. A ministry, by the way, just hop over to chapter 4, that began a little over a year earlier, when our Lord and six of His disciples He had chosen at that point, who would become apostles, when our Lord and those six returned from Jerusalem, went through Samaria, and came back up to Galilee, we read the beginning of our Lord's great Galilean ministry. Chapter 4, starting in verse 43. After the two days that our Lord had spent there in Samaria, extra days in Samaria, He went forth from there into Galilee. This was the beginning of our Lord's great Galilean ministry. How did that turn out? Well, we get a summary statement. Verse 44, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Ominous words, right? Warning. We know Jesus was from Nazareth, right? John tells us the beginning of our Lord's great Galilean ministry. That Jesus testified, yep. A true prophet, he is the true prophet, would not be welcome. And as a result, we're told, verse 45, so when he came to Galilee, woo! The hero has returned! The Galileans received him. Based on our words that our Lord taught, nope having seen all the things he did. Miracles in Jerusalem with the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. The beginning of our Lord's great Galilean ministry? Oh yeah, a lot of people professed, oh, we believe, but their belief was based on the works. The end of our Lord's great Galilean ministry? Over a year later, chapter 6, what we've been studying the last several weeks, you have hostile, hearted religious leaders who rejected our Lord's works and words. You had half-hearted false disciples who loved our Lord's works but rejected His words. You had a small group of wholehearted true disciples who loved our Lord's works and His words, and you had a devil-hearted apostate disciple, Judas, who pretended to love our Lord, His works and words. Do you see it? Wow.
And so as I conclude, <laughs> I asked you twice at the beginning as we were introduced to these different groups and their responses, I asked you to kind of ask yourself some questions, such as what do you think of our Lord's works and our Lord's words? Where would you put yourself right now? Are you part of the group of wholehearted true disciples? Saying the words like Peter said in verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You part of that group? If so, that means you've been regenerated by God the Holy Spirit because no one can come to Christ unless it's been granted by the Father, right? Praise God. Or, when you think of our Lord's words, His exclusive, very narrow words of truth, His absolute words of truth, Have you been part of the group there in verse 60? Ah, oh, no, no. This is a difficult statement. Uh-uh. Can't swallow it. And as a result, verse 66. Do you often think about walking away? Walking away from Or you're part of that first group, hostile hearted. You don't even know why you're listening to this sermon. Somebody dragged you to it. <laughs> Maybe after this has been published on internet, in internet land or inter internetville, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Maybe you stumble across this and you're watching this and going, who's this guy and why do I even care to listen to these words? Well, friend, if that's you, you're not rejecting my words. As you notice, I'm just teaching the text. I'm not giving you my opinions. Are you feeling hostile hearted to what you've heard? Maybe you're in that group. Or, Are you just pretending to love Jesus, to sing to Jesus? You love his works, you love his words, you're pretending, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know down in the deepest recesses of your conscience, you don't love Jesus. Hard words, huh? Friends. This is reality. Three out of four groups. Rejection. One group, complete deception. Kind of reminds you of the parable, our Lord's parable of the four soils, which we had studied, right? Only one group. The elect. Wholehearted, true disciples. And so... Do you truly believe that Jesus is the bread of life? Do you believe in his deity, that he's the second person of the Trinity, who 2,000 years ago left heaven and came to this earth, taking on flesh? Do you believe that Jesus, here on earth, truly God, truly man, lived a perfect life, fulfilling the law perfectly, never sinning once? And then as the perfect, sinless, unblemished Lamb of God went to that cross and allowed our sins to be placed on Him and God's wrath to be poured out on Him instead of on us. Do you believe all that? Do you believe in that which our Lord declared, paid in full, 
He then died, but three days later he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for the sheep, his sheep, for whom he went to the cross for. And do you believe in who Jesus is, where he came from, and what he not only did, but also what he and only he can provide, the free gift of eternal life. And have you truly repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Christ alone? Have you eaten of his flesh? Have you drinking of his blood? Have you come to Christ? Have you beheld Christ? And do you truly believe in Christ? And can you declare without a shadow of a doubt, Lord, I don't want to go to anyone or anything else You have the words of eternal life, and I believe that you are the Holy One of God. For those of us who can say without a shadow of a doubt, yes, I believe and I know that Jesus is the bread of life. And I have eaten of his flesh, and I have drinking of his life, and I know I have the free gift of eternal life. Friends, in silent prayer now, you praise the Lord. You praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because no one can come to Christ unless it's been granted to them by God. And Christian, you're one of the elect. And you praise God for his most amazing grace and his most marvelous mercy. But for the rest of you, who are going, I'm not sure I can make that declaration or that I've ever made it, like Peter did. Maybe today can be that day where you stop rejecting Christ. Maybe for some of you where you stop deceiving yourselves. Maybe today is that day where you receive all of Christ who he is and his works and his words. Spend some time now 